Well, I don't know anything about brains, and I don't know anything about ethics, and I certainly don't know anything about neuroessentialism. I'm a social psychologist. I study people. In, uh, as Peter was saying, in some recent uh, years, I've been applying some basic principles of evolutionary biology to my work. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a few facts about some of this work and then connect it to the themes. My story starts with these, these uh, bacteria and other parasites that have been a part of human ecologies for as long as there have been human ecologies and which cause, you know, a lot of terrible infectious diseases. Uh, so by some estimates, infectious diseases have caused more death in human evolutionary history than, you know, all other causes of death put together. So they, you know, impose tremendous selection pressures and as a result, you know, we've evolved this, the, uh, the immune system, uh, which uh, is, provides a defense against these, uh, these, these parasites when they get inside our body. And it's wonderful to have, but it's got its limitations. You know, it, uh, when, it, when it kicks in, it's very metabolically costly. Uh, when it kicks in, it causes fever and fatigue and other unpleasant consequences. And of course, it's merely reactive. You know, it doesn't actually kick in until these bugs have already gotten inside our body. Uh, and so it's good to have, and there seems to have evolved also, this proactive uh, defense, which I think of as this, uh, this behavioral immune system, which uh, is designed, well, it's a psychological system that is designed to detect these, uh, these sources of infections out there and to respond diversely and adaptively to these sources of infection. One of the implications is that uh, when, uh, when diseases are especially salient, uh, it has all kinds of implications for our, uh, for our thoughts and actions, including implications uh, that promote uh, safer sex practices. And also, we just tend to be more, more socially cautious and generally, less, uh, less extroverted, less gregarious. It also promotes prejudices of various sorts, not just against sick people, but against anybody who just looks different from the human prototype. People who are disabled or disfigured or old, or obese. Uh, another implication is that when disease threat is salient, that it makes us more xenophobic. And uh, so that uh, when people feel more vulnerable to disease, they're just more prejudiced against people who are subjectively foreign in some way. Uh, another interesting implication is that when people feel more vulnerable to disease, they're more conformist. In part, this is because a lot of traditions and norms serve as buffers and barriers against uh, the transmission of diseases. So when uh, diseases are psychologically salient, people respond more harshly to people who are deviants and free thinkers, and they're more conformist themselves. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, you know, one result there, which compared to a control condition, people who, uh, who are thinking about other threatening things tend to be somewhat more conformist to majority opinion, but people uh, for whom diseases are salient are especially more conformist to majority opinion. Another interesting implication is that these kinds of effects manifest uh, across entire societies. So that is, in places where pathogens have historically been more prevalent, people uh, are less extroverted, they are more xenophobic, they, uh, they're more conformist, they have less individualistic values, they have more collectivistic values. So one of the implications is that this behavioral immune system may actually help us understand some of the origins of some really important cross-cultural differences. Um, one additional implication that's uh, pretty intriguing is that the operation of the behavioral immune system may actually have implications for what the real immune system does. So we did a study several years ago in which we, uh, we showed people pictures uh, of either diseasey people or of threatening looking people holding guns. We drew blood, we exposed the blood to a bacterial agent that stimulates white blood cells to produce an immunological response and we found that the diseasey pictures actually led to a stronger immunological response against infection than the control pictures. So uh, the question that you should be asking of course is what does any of this have to do with what we're talking about here? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not sure, but uh, let me just say a few thoughts. I think that part of what uh, this gets at is this idea that, well, this obviously, this evolutionary perspective on human nature clearly biologizes 
uh, us. And, uh, and this sometimes freaks people out. <laughs> and one reason it freaks people out is because, uh, you know, when people link human nature to human evolution, we tend to sometimes use metaphors that leave our humanists, including our brains, out of the picture entirely. So Richard Dawkins, for instance, compares uh, famously uh, people to gigantic lumbering robots manipulated by genes. But Dawkins also emphasized the fact that, uh, that genes only influence our actions by building brains. And uh, he wrote, genes are the primary policy makers, but brains are the executives. And these brains are excellent executives. You know, they're very flexible and they're very strong and they're very smart. And one reason why they're, why they're so smart and so flexible is because we, uh, we evolved in, in this very fluid, very, very so intensely social environment. So. By, uh, by saying, you know, we are our genes from an evolutionary perspective is not unlike saying we are something that evolved within a highly dynamic social ecology and as a result is extraordinarily sophisticated and flexible and pretty damn unpredictable too. Uh, one final thought, and this actually relates to something that Saskia brought up and we haven't really talked about, and it relates to a kind of a, a, kind of a dualism, not the old-fashioned Cartesian dualism, but kind of an ironic new dualism in which we tend to think of brains as, uh, as something by itself, separate from, uh, from the rest of the body. And from an evolutionary perspective, this is kind of weird because, you know, brains don't survive without bodies, brains don't reproduce, bodies do. And uh, so, you know, brains don't just make thoughts and feelings, they make bodies move, and it's only by making bodies move that, uh, that brains actually have any adaptively meaningful implications at all. So, anyway, if one takes an evolutionary approach to the study of human nature, I think it logically compels us to think about the, the, the connections between where our genes, where our brains, and where are our bodies too. Thank you.